سورة المباركة الفاتحة the love of the baby who we are commemorating tonight Ali in al azhar please recite one loud sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad a'udhu billahi min ash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد A way to save your humanity Imam al-Mahdi عليه السلام My respected elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته on this night, on the night of Ashura, our condolences first and foremost go out to the master of our age, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. And we know that tonight he is in the city of Karbala al-Muqaddisa, whereby he is gathered around millions of people who are trying their best to console him and doing their utmost to please him tonight through the martyrdom of Aba Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our condolences go out to him first and foremost tonight and tomorrow as well our condolences go out to our maraja al kiram to all the ulama to all the mu'mineen around the world and indeed this is a human tragedy which is unlike any other tragedy to have befallen humanity and therefore our condolences tonight go out to everybody in humanity for Imam Hussain was a representative of everyone, every species, every insect, everything in this universe tonight is mourning Hussain and everyone tomorrow and everything in this universe is mourning Hussain. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude and thanks to the entire community for extending their invite to the most holiest of nights allowing us to learn and partake with you. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our commentary has been beneficial and that it has left something in the heart. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have the opportunity to meet again, insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Our commentary of Ziyarat al-Waritha has arrived at the final three names in whom Imam Hussain alayhi salam is dedicated as being the inheritor of. Yesterday, we spoke about the verse which states, Assalamu alayka ya waritha Muhammadin Habibillah. Peace and blessings be upon you, O the inheritor of Muhammad, who is the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as such, when we looked at Rasulullah and his relationship to the master of the martyrs, we stated that this relationship is of a multitude of ways. 
For example, of course, we could state that there is a relationship based upon the lineage. And because Imam Hussein alayhi salam is the grandson, and therefore there is a specific inheritorship based upon his blood lineage. And of course, we could state that because Rasulullah was going to pass away, his authority and his lineage would take from him and thus we might observe the line Assalamu alayka ya waritha Muhammadin Habibillah in this light. However, the reality of the relationship we stated was actually personified and actually appreciated by us through the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had dictated their relationship before the entrance into this physical realm. In that, his leadership, his character, the authority that had been devolved to Imam Hussein alayhi salam is that which really gives him to become the inheritor of Rasulullah. Before he was even born, he had been appointed. And when you look at their lives together, for the few number of years that they had together, there was a special bond and relationship that these two had with each other. Be it from the moment in which Imam Hussein alayhi salam was born, or from the times in which he used to play with Rasulullah as a young child, to the time in which Rasulullah eventually departed. Hence the statement, Husaynum minni wa ana min al That there is the two way relationship between these two. That as much as Hussein alayhi salam is to come from Rasulullah, whatever Hussein alayhi salam stands for, Rasulullah took from him as well. And therefore, they are joined together in that special bond, that relationship. And we highlighted that being the inheritor of Rasulullah demands that you take upon his personality. It takes upon his righteousness. It takes upon his human ethic. And we highlighted just a couple of stories about the phenomenal nature of Rasulullah. And we stated that as Muslims, we are required to know in depth the life of Rasulullah. This doesn't mean that I just know the battle names that he went into or the year that he migrated. His personality is one that I need to mold myself against. He is that exemplar and therefore I need to look at myself as someone who tries to measure all my actions against him. And thus if you look at how Imam Hussein alayhi salam acted, they were mirror images of each other in the likes of their compassion, in the likes of their appreciation for humanity and how they engage with each other and everybody else around them. And thus this evening, <coughs> we want to look at the remaining three names that are mentioned as being the inheritors in Ziyarat al-Waritha. Assalamu alayka ya waritha, amil al Mu'mineen, Ali alayhi salam. Peace and blessings be upon you, O the inheritor of the commander of the faithful, Ali. Peace and blessings be upon you, Assalamu alayka ya waritha, Fatima al-Zahra, Sayyidati Nisa al-Alameen. Peace and blessings be upon you, O the inheritor of Fatima, the leader of the women of all of these worlds. And Assalamu alayka ya waritha, Khadija al-Kubara. Peace and blessings be upon you, the inheritor of Khadija, the utmost great and supreme. And thus, as we have been stating in the previous nights, the inheritorship has to be looked more and beyond the concept of just being the inheritor of lineage. Because the other prophets and anbiya that have been mentioned before aren't necessarily going to have left that lineage for Imam Hussain alayhi salam to inherit from. As an example, Musa alayhi salam, as an example, Isa alayhi salam, from the physical lineage perspective, Imam Hussain alayhi salam is not the inheritor from them. And thus, in the same way, we try to understand the concept of inheritorship in regards to what these individuals stood for, in regards to what their proximity was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing we realize is that when it comes to the concept of imamat or the concept of risalat, 
we have stated that every single prophet would engage with their community in their own individual way. We highlighted that Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, in the way in which they engaged with their communities was very unique. Musa alayhi salam came to his community in a time in which they believed in magicians and so forth. And thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala convinced his community through proving that this magic was nothing compared to the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, in regards to Isa alayhi salam, the community believed and looked towards medicines and doctors. And therefore Isa alayhi salam was given the miraculous cures. And at the time of Rasulullah, they believed in poetry to the extent that they had annual competitions in Mecca. And so Rasulullah was given a piece of great literature which was to remain supreme until the end of time. Thus, we cannot state that this concept of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses and deals with mankind halts there. We can't state that because that would be in opposition to the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says several times in his holy book, فَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا You will not find a change in the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We normally would state that only Rasulullah has a sunnah. I am following the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt. Meaning a path, a way, a methodology. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has his own methodologies that need to be understood in creation. He has his own sunnah. And therefore, if I understand his sunnah, I will never go wrong as to how he deals with creation. And thus, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has individuals, and individual prophets that are sent relative to communal circumstance, and of course, imamat is now the extension to prophethood, the concept must also be devolved towards the understanding of imamat. In regards to imamat, each imam looked at their community in light of their current circumstance, in light of their current weakness, in light of that which needed to be instituted into the community and thus taught them in accordance with the need of the time. For example, if you look at our fourth imam, Zain al-Abideen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the period in which he was the Imam was riddled with, of course, the worst of spirituality. Because if after 60 years of having passed Rasulullah's time and you could murder, if you could murder, if you could do what you do on the 10th of Muharram to the grandson of Rasulullah, what spirituality has remained within the community? The community has turned on its head 180 degrees. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instituted appointed caliphs. The community had instituted a monarchical system. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instituted a love for Ahlul Bayt, sallallahu alayhim ajma'een. The community had instituted captivity, bloodshed for the very same people. And therefore, the way in which Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam had to deal with his community was very specific. Hence, we find that he instituted certain things at his time in order to begin that revolution. Aza was instituted at that time as a means of spiritually cleansing the self through the wisdom of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. He introduced Risalat al-Huquq. At that time, they weren't even rights for Ali al Azghar. The community prior to Rasulullah were called the community who are Jahil, the period of Jahiliyyah. But if you look within their histories, they at least had some very basic rights that they used to place upon each other. As an example, they would state that there are four months in which fighting is haram, correct? That happened prior to Islam. Islam adopted it because it was a good thing. 61 years later, what kind of rights were there when someone like Ali al-Azghar's 
throat can be slit from one side to another. A poet says, your father took you out so that he may something and you may drink some water. By the time he brought you back, you had drunk from your own blood. What kind of human rights were there? And thus, as such, Imam Zain al-Abadin alayhi salam, he had to institute basic rights, the rights between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rights between you and a prayer leader, a right between you and a muazzin, a right between you and your hands, a right between you and your stomach. People hadn't even considered these things. And therefore, the Imam had to institute it relative to his time. And thus, of course, one of the most beautiful and pure ways of ensuring there is genuine spirituality in the self is to have communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, giving us Sahifa Sajjadiyya, du'as, whereby we can communicate and we can speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give ourselves in our entirety. If we need a du'a for our parents, it's there. If we need a du'a for our children, it's there. If we need a du'a for our rizq, it's there. And so on and so forth. The Imam observed the time in which he was living in and instituted in accordance with that. If you go along the way, you will find each Imam did exactly the same thing. Our fifth Imam, the splitter open of knowledge. Our sixth Imam, the great giant and teacher of all the madahib. And so on and so forth. Every Imam deals with instituting the religion in accordance with the need of the time. This is an extension of prophethood. And therefore, فَلَنْتَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah does not change. If you understand this, you will understand what imamat actually is. When we say, As-salamu alayka ya waritha, amil al-mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam, we are not just talking about an inheritor in terms of lineage. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was an inheritor of an institute governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The institute is imamat. On the day of Ghadir, we say, al akmaltu lakum dinukum." On this day, the religion has become completed and perfected. When we say this, we often think that it's become complete because of the appointment of an individual. This is not correct. It is complete because of the establishment of wilayat, whichever wilayat it may be. It is complete because of the establishment of imamat as now a movement away from the cessation of nabuwat to the path of imamat as an institute before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that each imam governed in accordance with the time in which they lived in and needed to show us a face of Islam in accordance with the time in which they live in. Rasulullah was a prophet for 23 years. If we are to only take Rasulullah and just his ahadith, then of course we would fall short because there are things that happened after Rasulullah's life that of course we need answers to, don't we? Hence the concept of imamat. Because imamat is a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue for us so we know what to do post Rasulullah. Hence imamat is an obvious necessity for us. In that in every period of time, we have a divinely appointed leader. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is part of that institute. Hence when we say the warith of Amil al Mu'mineen, it means he is now the inheritor of the institute of wilayat. Whatever wilayat stood for, whatever imamat stood for, which was the face of the religion in accordance to the time, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was that thing. Very simply put, if you look at just a couple of years before him, his brother Imam al Hassan alayhi salam chose not to rise against the enemies of the time. Whereas just a couple of years later, his brother Imam al Hussein alayhi salam chose to rise. The Institute of Imamat always declares and shows us what is the absolute utmost action at that time, in that circumstance and shows us how Islam has a face relative to the circumstance of the time. And that's the beauty of the Imamat. The question, of course, would be, if Amir al-Mu'mineen instituted X, Imam al-Hassan instituted X, each Imam instituted and showed us 
a slightly different face of Islam in accordance with the time in which we're living. What is the face of Islam today under the imamat of Imam al-Mahdi? Allah Ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif. And so Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam is the inheritor of that. He is the inheritor of the institute of imamat which was there to rise against the evils of that time. If you look at Amir al-Mu'mineen in the way in which he was, Zahra sallamullahi alayha, in the which the way she was, Lady Khadija al-Kubra sallamullahi alayha, in the way in which she was, you will see their individual personalities and the way in which they acted imbibed into the personality of the master of the martyrs. Where to begin? Where to begin in regards to Amir al-Mu'mineen? How does one actually speak about Amir al-Mu'mineen and the qualities of this man? There is no tongue that can truly do justice to him. No tongue at all that can truly speak about him. No mind that can truly comprehend him. Just to elaborate on this point, there's a famous tradition that is found within the book Kitab al-Irshad by Shaykh al-Mufid alayhi rahmah. This narration is narrated by the sixth Imam who narrates, my father said the following incident. It's a wonderful chain of narrations. Sixth Imam says, fifth Imam said about an incident in his life. What occurred? Fifth Imam said, one day, after the sun had risen, after the sun had risen after Fajr Salah, I left my house, and as I walked, coming out of his house, opposite me, was my father, the fourth Imam. Sixth Imam narrates from the fifth Imam, who narrates an incident about the fourth Imam. My father was coming out of his house and was walking towards me. I saw him in such a state. What state? I saw that his eyes had become red from crying all night to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw his lips were dry from how much he had been performing tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw his stomach had become shrunken from having fasted so much for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I saw a mark of frustration so heavy on his forehead from how much he had been in sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth imam, my father, approached me, the fifth imam, and said to me, O oh Muhammad Baqir, please go and bring me the parchments of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Parchments meaning the scriptures. The scriptures of the du'as formed by Amir al-Mu'mineen. Bring me the du'a books that Amir al-Mu'mineen used to recite from. So I went into the house and I got the du'a and I got the books and I handed it to my fourth imam, my father. Now here, who is the fourth imam? Zainul Abidin. Consider the description the fifth Imam has just given him. Consider his title, the adornment, the beautification of all the possible worshippers. We know his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Sahih as Jadiya. The fifth Imam hands him this parchment of du'a which is recited by Amir al-Mu'mineen. He hands it to him and begins to recite. As he's reading it, Zain al-Abideen begins to shake. He stops recitation and says, ah, ah, who can perform the worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib except Ali ibn Abi Talib? If Zayn al-Abideen, if Zayn al-Abideen struggles in his own way to comprehend the ibadat of Ali ibn Abi Talib, how are we going to describe Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi? Here, though we say that, we may look at his life and we may be able to see and observe how Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam lived. There is a verse of the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the concept of sacrifice and generosity, which according to some of those who commentate on the Holy Quran, this verse is possibly the highest verse in regards to giving in regards to sacrifice. The verse comes to us from Surah Al-Imran, verse number 92, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَارُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ 
you will by no means achieve the high station of righteousness. You will not achieve the high station of righteousness until you manage to give from that which you love. Subhanallah, what a wonderful verse. You will not be able to achieve the grand station of righteousness until you give from that which you love. Now here, look at the wording. Because many of us give away and we give. But alhamdulillah, when we give, we end up giving that thing which is not so important to us. For example, if I buy something new for myself, a new pair of shoes or a new pair of clothes, in order to make space in the wardrobe, I take out the old pair and give it away to charity. And I think, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I'm very noble, I've done a lot of generosity, I've looked after the poor and the needy and the homeless. That's not giving away what you love. It's giving away what's tattered. It's giving away that which is seven years old. Imagine giving away that which is most beloved to you. Giving away that which is the most closest thing to you. That is the challenge of a human being to see as to whether he really is altruistic. As to whether he is generous. Imagine now, I buy a new pair of shoes. And I see someone on the street without any shoes. I've just bought that pair of shoes. I've just saved up for that pair of shoes. Am I capable of giving away to the individual who needs it more than me? That is the test. You will by no means achieve a You give that which you love most. That which is closest to you. All of us have different love. Some of us love food. Some of us love sleep. Some of us love our spare time. Some of us love things. Sacrifices isn't giving away something that they don't want. They're giving away something that is clearly dearest to them. That is the sign of someone who really gives. There is an emotion attached to this particular verse from Surah Al Imran. One day it said, the command he had said, to buy himself a new shirt. Why? Because his shirt was tattered. So eventually, he said, himself the new shirt. Imagine, Amil al Mumin would load his shirt, would have patched his own shirt, to the point where eventually it became so tattered, now it is the time to go and buy himself a new shirt. He goes to market, buys that shirt, on the way back, he finds someone without a shirt. Of course, you know what he's going to do. He goes and gives the shirt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَن تَنَارُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُ مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not achieve a grand station of righteousness until you manage to give from that which you love most. This, this was the individual. This is the kind of individual that Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam had to inherit from. On the 10th of Muharram, when we talk about sacrifice, we talk about a grand sacrifice. You know why he is the master of sacrifice, Aba Abdullah alayhi salam? Because when he gave, he gave again. And when he gave, he gave again. And when he gave, he gave and gave and gave until literally there was nothing left to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gave his family members. He gave his community. He gave his head. He gave everything. The wealth didn't matter to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, so we don't count that. But to give the most dearly beloved to you, that is the difficult thing to do. To know, to have the ma'rifa and the awareness that in a moment, when I give this child towards the enemies and ask for a drop of water, they will quench his thirst with a three-pronged arrow. That is giving, because you give and you give until the point where you've given everything you can humanly give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ending of which culminates in the giving of his own head, as opposed to the giving of his own hand. Thus, he is the inheritor of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And thus, when we say he is the inheritor of Lady Khadija, salamu alayhi alayha, in the same way, Lady Khadija, salamu alayhi alayha, gave and gave and gave. For her to give her wealth 
was nothing. It doesn't matter to her. And therefore to say she sacrificed her wealth wouldn't truly be a correct statement because it wasn't a sacrifice for her. She didn't give anything up. She loved the gift for the sake of Islam. But there are times, or there were times when Lady Khadija sallallahu did sacrifice and did give away things that were so important. Things that were going to leave that lasting impact to Rasulullah in the time in which he lived. Think about an elderly lady. Think about an elderly lady who had to go up and down Ghar Hira twice a day for the sake of her husband. When we go today to Ghar Hira and we visit in the city of Mecca, it is easy for us to walk. They've made, they've made slates, they've made steps. It's easier for us. 1400 years ago, that was an actual mountain. You and I get tired walking up one or two flights of steps. Imagine an elderly lady twice a day carrying food and water up towards Rasulullah and then down. And then up again and then down. From the human perspective, how much must this have fatigued her? From the human perspective, how much must this have physically drained her to have done this in the heat of Mecca? In the heat of Mecca. And therefore when she sacrificed, she literally sacrificed herself. She gave away herself, her body, her fatigue. Actually, it goes even further than this. Lady Khadija sallallahu alayha gave away not just her wealth, not just her health. She gave away her station and position within Arabia. Within Arabia, she was the most prominent of ladies. Her wealth, her business acumen, her spirituality, everybody wanted to marry Lady Khadija sallallahu alayha. Everybody wanted that honor to have such a pious wife, such a generous wife, such a phenomenal wife within the community. By the end of it, because of her allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet, she was left without nothing whatsoever. Nothing. Do you know to what extent she was left without nothing? On the day in which she gave birth to Lady Zahra sallallahu alayha, there is a narration about this that took place. She was about to go into labor. And when someone goes into labor, you have a midwife, someone to take care of you, someone to assist you in the birth, someone to give you all the support morally and physically that they can give to you at that moment in time. She exits her house and calls to the women of Mecca and says, Oh women, I'm about to go into labor. Who is there to assist me in the birth? Do you know what the response was from the women of Mecca? You are supporting that man Muhammad. We will not help you one iota in giving birth. You would think at that moment, being Lady Khadija, sallallahu alayha, the whole of Mecca would have ran to assist her at that moment. She was left alone. She had given everything up for the sake of Rasulullah. That even in that moment, there was no one to assist her in giving birth. The hadith continues, as she went back into her house, four lights descended in front of her. The first one introduced and said, I am your grandmother Hawa. The next one said, I am Asiya, wife of Aun. The next one said, I am Maryam, salamu alayha. And the next one stated, I am Umm Qutum, the sister of Musa. If no one is here to help you, we have descended from the heavens to come and help you in the birth of Fatima to Zahra. Oh. The inheritor of Lady Khadija, salamu alayha. She had given everything for the sake of Allah, that even the authority that she had within the community had gone. She gave away her position for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who here wants to give away their position for anything? Normally, my position is my position. I don't want to give it away. If I'm the leader of the community, I want everyone to know. Everyone has to follow me. When you give, you give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus, this light was left with nothing to 
to the level in which famous Masaib says that when Rasulullah came to bury her, she didn't even have a coffin, didn't even have a cloth. Let me ask you a question. How cheap is a single sheet of cloth? How cheap? Can you find something in the society today in terms of purchasing that is cheaper than that? Really? For your household goods, is there anything cheaper than a little piece of cloth? A plain piece of cloth? Today, thousands are spent on fashion. Thousands on suits. Thousands on jumpers. Thousands on dresses. One cloth she didn't have. Thus, the famous Maqtal reads that he, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, raises his head and says, Ya Rasulullah, she had given everything in the way. Where is the cloth for Lady Khadija to be buried? Jibra'il Amin descends with five cloths. Five cloths. The first one was for Khadija. The second for Rasulullah. The next for Zahra. The next for Amir al muminin And the fifth for Hassan al-Mujtaba. Salam Allahi alayhim ajma'een. Rasulullah would look and say, Jibra'il, where is the fifth cloth? Where is the fifth coffin? Ya Rasulullah, your grandson will die without a coffin. Your grandson will die without a coffin. Lady Um Kurthum, sallallahu alayha, is narrated to have said that as they left the body, as they walked past the body, she saw the body and she turned her face towards Medina and said, Ya Rasulullah, O oh grandfather, come from Medina to Karbala and see your grandson without a coffin. His body is left bare without a coffin. Today, his blood gives him his ghusl and the sands of Karbala cover him in his coffin. Assalamu alaikum ya walitha Khadija al-Kubra. Because Hussein gave everything to the extent that he didn't even have a coffin on the tent of Muharram. He gave it everything, just like Lady Khadija sallallahu alayha, gave even her position in authority. He gave everything, everything he had for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus we say, Assalamu alayka, ya walitha, Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayha. Assalamu alayka, ya walitha, Fatima, Sayyidati Nisa al alameen Please and blessings be upon you. The inheritor of Zahra, the leader of all the women. Zahra, sallallahu alayha, was a flower from the garden of paradise itself. Zahra, sallallahu alayha, a mother who loved her children so much that she would go hungry and thirsty for them. She, if there was one loaf of bread left in the house, would divide it into two, and then divide it into two again, and give this to Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Um Kurthum. On the 10th of Muharram, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he had given everything to the point he couldn't even offer water to his own children. Zahra sallallahu alayha was someone who was such a noble woman that everyone would come to her and seek from her. A famous narration says that one day she is in her house and someone comes and knocks upon her door. She opens and it is a lady of the community. The lady says to her, I have questions for you, do you mind? Zahra says, no, please go ahead. Ask whatever it is that you want to ask. The lady asks a question, Zahra sallallahu alayha answers it. She asks another question, Zahra sallallahu alayha answers it and answers it. The narration says after ten questions back and forth, answers back and forth, the lady stops and becomes embarrassed. Oh Zahra, I feel sorry for you. I am so sorry. I have taken so much of your time. I have asked and I have asked from your time. She says, why are you complaining? Why are you apologizing? This is our responsibility to give to you. Whatever you want, we give in your way. We stop and we give in your way. It's 
There is no trouble in us because this is our duty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that lady, imagine that lady who walked into her own father and her own prophet's masjid and had to demand her rights. Imagine that lady who had to stand in front of the tyrants of the time and demand her rights. If Zahra was the one who could stand up to the greatest of tyrants of her time, where do you think Hussein ibn Ali got his strength to stand up to Yazid from? It was instituted and flowing in his blood because his mother was to do it. There are narrations after narrations about what happened to Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein in regards to that day when she, Salamullahi alayha, had to go and establish her rights and demand for what was hers. One narration says that she had such strength, such strength, that one narration says that Amir al Mu'mineen, as they attacked the house, after the door fell on Zahra, think about this. Zahra sallallahu alayha, the door had crushed her. She had lost her child. Look at the parallel to Hussein ibn Ali. She had lost her child. Hussein ibn Ali was about to lose his child. Zahra, after losing her child, had to go towards the tyrants and go and stand up. Hussein ibn Ali, after losing his Azkar, had to go and stand up. How does a parent have the strength to do that? Physically, emotionally have the strength to be able to go and stand up for your rights at that moment. Zahra left her house. Amir al-Mu'mineen is narrated to have said, or the incident about Amir al-Mu'mineen is specific. Do you know how it describes him? It says that they tied a rope around the neck of Ali ibn Abi Talib and they dragged him like a camel towards the pulpit of his own grandfather, the pulpit of his own cousin and brother Rasulullah. How strong is a camel? How strong is a camel? And what must it look like to drag a camel kicking and fighting? Ali ibn Abi Talib in the hadith is described that he was dragged like a camel towards the pulpit of his own grandfather, up to the pulpit of his own prophet and messenger. At that moment, having already borne the burden of the door falling upon her, Zahra takes Hassan in one hand, Hussein in the other hand, in towards the masjid. The narration says, the second caliph puts a sword to the neck of Ali and says, Oh Ali, if you do not give us allegiance, we will kill you. At this moment, Hassan has to walk in to the masjid, Masjid al Nabawi. Hassan and Hussein are young children. Do you know what happens? The narration says, Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein begin to cry, hearing this threat from the second caliph. Oh Ali, if you do not give us allegiance, we will cut your neck. Hassan and Hussein begin to cry. Imam Ali turns around and says, Hassan and Hussein, do not cry, do not cry. Do you know why? These people can never kill me. These people can never kill me. I'll never be able to stop who Ali ibn Abi Talib really is. This is Zahra and her strength. You know what happened that evening? The narration state that she gets on a horse. Imam Ali alayhi salam takes the reins of that horse and leads her to the house of everyone, everyone in Medina who was there with the pledge of Ghadir Khum. And she knocks on the door and calls out the women. Oh women folk, ask your husbands, were they not there? Were they not there on the 18th of Dhul Hijjah and they gave pledge of allegiance to my husband Ali ibn Abi Talib? Why is it that they had become so treacherous and left him? She did this. She stood up for Ali ibn Abi Talib after all of these incidents had taken place. Imagine the strength of Zahra sallallahu alayha. Another narration states, or uh, Zakir says this is a line of poetry. A line of poetry that takes place. He says 
that when Zahra Sunamullah alayha went to go and obtain her rights of Fadak, she actually got it written. But eventually on her return back, the second caliph snatched it from her and ripped it and shredded it and threw it on the floor. She says, well there is a line of poetry that describes what happened and how broken she felt at that moment. The line of poetry was, that when she went and left her house, she took Imam al Hassan in her hand. In her hand. Meaning her as a mother held the hand of Imam al Hassan. After she came back in that alleyway and the second caliph had ripped up that piece of paper, she felt so broken and dejected at that moment, Imam al Hassan had her hand in his hand. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam had to bring her back to the house at that moment in time. Imagine what it must have been like now. Hussein ibn Ali returned several times back and forth with his child in his hand. The first to come out and greet that child was Sakina bint al Hussein. Sakina came running out, Father, did they quench the thirst? The, the Maqtal says, Imam and Hussein says, Child, take this body because Hussein cannot bear this anymore. This trial and tribulation is too much for Imam and Hussein. This, this is the strength of Hussein ibn Ali to go again to the battlefield. To bury his own child after all of this. Assalamu alayka ya waritha. Fatima al Zahra, Sayyidati Nisa al Alameen. Assalamu alayka ya waritha. Khadija al Kubara. Assalamu alayka ya waritha. Amin al Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib. He embodied that responsibility. Gave and gave to the extent when there was nothing left to give, all he could give was his head to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. switch the lights. And thus, on this night, on this night of the 10th of Muharram, Ali al Azghar and this small baby to sacrifice himself. It is said, it is said that Imam والسلام, stood all alone on the 10th of Muharram. How can the warith of Adam and Noah and Ibrahim and Musa, and Isa, and Rasulullah, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Khadija stand alone on the 10th of Muharram, I ask you. How is that possible that humanity, those who loved Musa, could not come to his aid? Those who loved Isa could not come to his aid? Those who love Rasulullah could not come to his aid. Those who love Ali ibn Abi Talib could not come to his aid. Ya Abu Abdullah, tonight we come to your aid. He stands all alone on the tenth of Muharram and he calls out, "Hal min nasirin yansurna, hal min mughithin yughithuna." Who is there to come to our aid? Who will come and help the grandson of Rasulullah? Who will come to the aid of the women of the grandchildren of Rasulullah? Who will help Zainab bin Um Kulthum? Who will help all of the women? At that moment, we hear that the child of Abu Abdullah, he couldn't speak. He couldn't cry out because of the thirst was killing him. And so all he could do with, with his body, the strength left in the body of Ali and Al-Azkar was that he began to rock his own cradle back and forth until maybe he fell from his cradle. Labbaik ya Abu Abdullah. Qasim has gone. Akbar has gone. 
Abbas is no longer there. Father, I will give myself for you. They pick up this young baby, this six-month-old child, and they call out, Ya Aba Abdullah, come back to the tents. The mother of Azhar, she has become dry of milk. They come and they wrap him in a sheet. Khadija, if there was no sheet for you, that's because you gave it to Azhar on the 10th of Muharram. They wrapped Azhar in a sheet. Do you know why they wrapped Azhar in a sheet? Because they wanted to protect him from the burning sun, the afternoon sun of Iraqi desert. I ask you a question. If they wanted to protect Azhar from the heat by giving him just a very small sheet, how is that going to protect his neck from a three-pronged arrow? They gave the baby to Abba Abdullah. Oh, Abba Abdullah, this child is dying of thirst. His eyes sunk back into his head. His tongue is so dry. His mother does not produce any milk. Please go out and bring some water for this child. Imam al Hussein stands out and brings this child. As they see it, they ask themselves, the enemies say, is Imam looking to arbitrate? Has he brought the Quran to make some sort of arbitration between us? At that moment, he, un he begins to take out the cloth and remove it and put Azgar into the people's limelight. He shows Azgar to the people. He calls out, O oh, enemies, if I have wrong, then so be it. Your complaint is with me. But I ask you a question. What has this six-month-old baby done? What has this child done? He is so thirsty. Please give him a drop of water. The enemies begin to cry. They begin to cry and begin to turn to each other. Maybe we should give this child a drop of water. Ya Aba Abdullah. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, No, we shall not give him any water. Imam al Hussein says, Fine, if you think I will drink the water, I will put this baby down on the ground. Oh Aba Abdullah, the plains of Kalbala are so hot, so hot you want to put Azgar down onto the ground. If you think I will drink, Assalamu alayka ya waritha Ibrahim Khalilillah When he was on the ground He kicked the ground And the water gushed forth If this was his smile Wallah If his feet on that ground All the water of all the oceans Would have come for Ali in al-Azhar But the enemies of God couldn't give him one drop of water. He picked up Ali in the Lazgar and put him in his arms. A father always tries to shelter his children and his babies. At this moment, Umar ibn Sa'ad sees that the army is beginning to turn away. The army is beginning to cry. He turns to the expert marksman, Hulmala. Oh, Hulmala, quieten this sign of Abba Abdullah. Lest now we lose all of our army to Abba Abdullah. How evil must you be? He puts the first arrow into his bow and he draws it back. As he draws it back, we are told that he sees a lady standing by the tents. That lady is the mother of Asghar, waiting to hear some news about the child. He fires the first arrow, it goes amiss. He takes the second arrow, he pulls it back. And again he sees in the corner of his eyes a lady pacing up and down. If Hajra paced up and down, imagine what the mother of Asghar was doing in that moment. He fires the second arrow, he goes amiss. 
But this time, this third arrow, there will be no miss from Hurmala. When Mukhtar al Thaqafi caught Hurmala and put him to death, he asked him, Tell me about the different arrows that you struck on the 10th of Muharram. He says, I struck the water of Abba. And I struck the eye of Abbas. I struck Abdullah ibn Hassan, who was standing in the arms of Hussein. I struck him with an arrow which I filled with poison. But there was another arrow which I struck, and this arrow was a three pronged arrow that I struck. You know, in the history of Arabia, there were two reasons as to why they used three pronged arrows. Listen to this, there were two reasons in history why they used to have three pronged arrows. The first one was when they wanted to break down a gate, they would strike a three pronged arrow into the gate and pull the arrow so that the gate or the door broke. How, how soft is the neck of Asghar and how hard is the gate? The second reason is because when they wanted to slaughter a camel, they would fire the arrow into the neck of the camel. And this arrow was big enough to slaughter a camel. I ask you, how, how wide is the neck of a camel? How small is the neck of a six-month-old child of Ali in Al-Azhar? Hurmala puts this three-pronged arrow. He takes it back at this moment. At this moment, there is no deviation in the arrow. This time, the arrow will fly true and straight. It flies in the air. Hussein sees this arrow coming towards him. Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah. At this moment, the arrow flies in the air. It strikes the neck of Ali in al Asghar. The Maktar says, Asghar flaps his arms. He begins to flap his arms like a bird. He is struggling, flapping his arms and moving himself. In front of his father. Father, you asked for a drop of water. They quenched it with an arrow. Father, do not cry. Father, do not cry. This is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asghar's body shakes. Asghar's body moves. Like a bird. Eventually, all the blood comes out of his body. Imam al Hussein takes this blood and he looks towards the sky. He wants to throw this blood towards the sky. The sky speaks. Oh, Hussein, if you put a drop of this blood in the sky, by Allah, we will not, we will not rain one drop until the end of time. Hussein wants to put the blood to the floor. The floor cries out, Hussein. We will not grow anything until the end of time. Imam al Hussein takes the blood of Oscar and pours it upon his own face and upon his own beard. He turns round back towards the camp. How do I show a mother what has just happened? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. He went back. He went back towards the enemy camp back towards his camp seven times up and down. One Maktal says that as he six, a voice comes from the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out, O oh Abu Abdullah, now go back towards the tents. Why? Because there's a mother who is waiting to hear about the outcome of her child. You know what has happened to Azhar. Go back towards the tent because there is a mother that is waiting. At this moment he returns. At this moment he returns. Sakina comes running out. Father, did they quench the thirst of my brother? It is narrated on the night of Sham e Gariba, after they had burnt the tents. It is narrated that they came and gave water to each of the children. Each of the children came and gave water 
The first person they wanted to give it to was Zayn al Abidin because of his state. They wanted to give it to Muhammad Bakir because of his state. Muhammad Bakir would give it to Sakina. Sakina took that glass of water and ran to the grave of Asghar. Asghar, now water has come. Now I will quench your thirst. There is Hasten the reappearance of the awakened Savior. Allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask you, Ya Allah. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming to raise us from our graves, that we may partake in the victory of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us this year and every year to perform the ziyarah of Ali al Azhar. One Dakir says, as we know, Ali in the chest of Aba Abdullah, that broken chest, because a child loves to fall asleep on the chest of their father. This year and every year. Ya Allah, those people don't have children. Ya Allah, there are many people around the world going through such desperate times. Those people who are hungry, those people who are in a state of poverty, those people without education, those people without medicines and in a state of war. Ya Allah, tonight, bihaqqi Ali al Azhar, grant them safety, security, victory, and betterment. Ya Allah, in the final moments of our life, as our soul is being taken from us, and I was to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, and raised in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A reminder for tomorrow, Maqtal in English, 11.45 sharp, we will reciting the whole Maqtal of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Please try to be there from 11.45, and thereafter we will have Salatul Jum'ah, and thereafter the Maqtal in Urdu, and thus we will break our Fakhr as well. Insha'Allah, we will see everyone tomorrow. Tonight is a night of Ibadat. Tonight is a night where we want to stay awake and better ourselves. On this night, all the family members and companions ensured that they perform their Salat al-Layl. If you can, insha'Allah, before you go to sleep, make sure you and I perform our Salat al-Layl so that we can come in some proximity to the companions of Ahlul Bayt. Sallamullahi alayhi majma'een. Can I ask you to remember Ali al-Azhar with a loud Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh.